continuing in 1 Peter this morning, continuing in chapter 1, our focus will be on verses 13 to 16. First Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, the word of the living God declares to us this morning, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And may he who is holy bless the reading of his word this morning. Our God, we come before you and we bless your name for the ability to, to even do that. For in and of ourselves, we do not deserve such a great and, and grand and wondrous privilege. But in Christ Jesus, we can boldly approach your throne of grace, your throne that the foundations of our justice and righteousness. But through your grace to us in Christ Jesus, we can boldly approach as the justice and righteousness that we need has been granted to us through him who has lived the perfect righteous life we never could. And has went to the cross in our stead and taken the justice that we deserve there in, in our place, dying the death we deserve gloriously rising from the dead, doing so that we would be saved from sin. And Father, as you know, as you declare clearly in your word, not that we would just be saved from the consequences of sin and hell, but that we would be saved from sin itself. And as, as the word of God also, Lord, you, you revealed that our Lord Jesus laid his life down for us, that we would be zealous for good works that we would be new creations where the old passes away and the new comes, that we would be made new and the image that we have distorted because of our sin would be, would be brought back uh, and, and conformed back into what it ought to look like, being conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as we continue to worship you this morning in spirit and truth and here through the preaching of your word, May you use this time greatly uh, as a means by which we are conti uh, continually conformed into the image of your Son, and the image of our great God and Savior. May we submit ourselves to your truth. May we see it uh, for what it is. For we, As we saw last Lord's Day, this has not come to us from men. This has come to us from you. You are the origin of Scripture. It's your word. We're here to have our minds renewed by it, by the work of the Holy Spirit to Breathe this word out through men. May that word be done within us this morning. May you strengthen our zeal for you. Certainly I believe in, in the context of being in a church that seeks to preach the full counsel of your word. We'll, we'll hear things this morning that, that we know, that we've heard before. Father, may we, may we eagerly take them in and, and may our desire for you and our desire for, for action towards you, and to be holy as you are holy. May that desire be strengthened this morning as we hear these truths. May we be reminded of truths where we need to be reminded, stirred up where we need to be stirred up. And in that, may we confess of, of, of laziness where perhaps we may need to confess of that and to, to repent and to turn from that. And Father, may you bless the preaching of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brethren, by way of introduction to this section of 1 Peter we're uh, beginning this morning, I want to read a parable that the Lord Jesus spoke during his earthly ministry. Uh, this parable is found in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, the Lord Jesus is speaking to the religious authorities of his day. And this is what he says in Matthew 21, verse 28 to 32. He says, what do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first son and 
said, Son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And this son answered, I go, sir. So in contrast to the first son who said, I will not, this one said, I will go. I go, sir. But he actually did not go. He said, I go, sir, but did not go. And then the Lord Jesus, speaking to the religious authorities of his day, he says, which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John, speaking of John the Baptist, John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. So they did get the answer right. The question that was asked, they, they didn't answer it rightly. Uh, it is the first son who did actually do the will of the father. And though he said he wouldn't go at first, he afterwards repented. He, he changed his mind. That's what it means to repent. He, he changed his mind. And thus he actually went and did what his father commanded him to do. But the second son didn't. Though he said he would, though he made a profession that he would go, I go, sir, I will do the will of the father. He didn't. He, he didn't actually do anything. And the religious authorities of Jesus' day at least understood that to properly submit to authority and do the will of the one over you is to actually do what they command you to do. That's, that's what it means to properly submit to, to the authority over you. At least they understood that, but then in understanding that and answering the question rightly, they did verbally condemn themselves because he was speaking of them and asking the question. As Jesus said in bringing this parable out to real life, the tax collectors and the prostitutes would enter the kingdom of God before them uh, because though the tax collectors and prostitutes were once in rebellion to their God and Creator, Basically saying, as the, as the first son, I, I will not. Though they were in rebellion, not wanting to do what he commanded them to do. When John the Baptist came preaching righteousness and repentance toward God, they repented. They repented. They, they changed their mind and actually believed what God was saying to them through John. And the evidence of that belief was a changed life in doing the will of the Father. Afterwards, they went as the first son and actually did what God commanded them to do. The religious elite, however, did not believe the truth, and as Jesus said, they still do. They still haven't afterwards changed their minds and believed the preaching of John the Baptist, though the one that John came to prepare the way for is literally right in front of them, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the truth himself, God in the flesh. The church, right along with the religious authorities, religious elite in Jesus' day. I'm, I'm afraid in what visibly calls itself the church in our day that there are a lot of religious authorities themselves who are just as separated from the truth as these were. Uh, the only difference is that in contrast to how those in Jesus' day answered, however, that them today, they would have answered that it was the second son who also did the will of the Father. The one who just made a profession and said, I go, sir, at one point in their life. The one who just said, I go, sir, but never actually did anything at all. Unfortunately, we see too much of that today in professing churches, and in that we also see from them an, uh, an affirming of other people's conversion, an, an, an affirming, an encouragement. Yes, you are in Christ. Yes, you are saved. Not because of how they are currently thinking and living, in their current believing upon Christ, but just because at one point in time they essentially said, I go, sir. Right? At one point in time in their life they said, yeah, I believe. They made a profession of faith. They raised their hand. They walked an aisle and prayed a prayer or something along those lines. Just because they did that action at some point in their life, many lost, false converts who are not reconciled to God in Christ are affirmed in their conversion while their life clearly shows that they have indeed not truly been converted at all. Their life clearly shows that they do not indeed believe upon Jesus because church true belief upon Jesus and his gospel looks like devotion and an actual love and a seeking to serve.
Jesus Christ and his gospel. An actual seeking of obedience towards him. Church, biblically, it does not matter if you prayed a prayer one time. It doesn't matter if you made some kind of profession of faith, however that may have looked. It doesn't matter if you've been placed in water by someone who called themselves a pastor. You can do all those things and still not be right with your God and Creator because if those things are not done in true belief, in true faith, meaning from the heart, you're actually entrusting yourself to Christ Jesus, and out of your trust and your utmost love for your Savior, you're actually seek, seeking to serve Him and honor Him from the heart in your life. If they're not done in true belief, then they mean absolutely nothing. They mean absolutely nothing at all. And church, the evidence that they are done in true belief, that actual saving belief is within a person, will show itself in that person persevering and that belief in Jesus, and actually seeking to live that out in obedience to his commands in their life. Right? We are saved by faith alone, but true saving faith shows itself in the life of the one who has it. We seek to do the will of him who has called us, in whom we have our faith in. It's just like the first son whose mind was changed. He actually changed his mind, and what did he do? He went and did the will of the Father. He went and did what the Father commanded him to do. You know, in no church, we will not do this perfectly, understandably. We, we're, even as converts, we are still sinners being conformed into the image of the Son. We will not do this perfectly. But though there will be sin remaining, we will not continue to willfully live in it and just justify it and be okay with it. That is not the heart and mind of a, of a convert, of a, of a Christian. We will fight against it because our natures have been changed in Christ Jesus. Because out of our belief in and love of Jesus Christ, we want to serve him and not a path of sin, not a path of rebellion, not the path that brought him to suffer for our sake. We don't want to show him a, a grave unkindness for his eternal good that he has given to us through his life and death on our behalf. If you love me, Jesus says in John 14, 15, you will keep my commandments. Right? If you love me, you will do this. And beloved... There is no such thing as a truly converted Christian who does not love Jesus Christ. That just, it just doesn't exist. That's just not a thing. And therefore, there is no such thing as a true Christian, someone who is actually right with God, who lives a life of ongoing, willful rebellion against Christ's commands. As we've seen from Peter already, beloved, true Christians have been born again to a living hope, and in that hope, in that new birth that they've been given by God, they are being guarded by God's power through faith until the fullness of salvation comes at the return of our Lord. And beloved, the scripture is very clear on what the life of one who has truly been born again to this living hope, being guarded by God's power, is to look like. And it looks like entrusting yourself to Christ and obeying Him, seeking to obey Him in your life. I'm going to read you 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 to 10. Little children, let no one deceive you, right? So here he is telling you, don't let somebody deceive you. They might try to deceive you in this area. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he or Christ is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident, or here, by this it is made clear, who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And church, I, I begin this way begin in this fashion because in this section that we're beginning in 1 Peter this morning, the apostle just shows us clearly this, this very truth. That if we're in Christ, we're in Christ, and that looks a certain way. We're, we're in Christ uh, not to just say, hey, I'm in Christ, but I look like everybody else in the world. I look just, my life looks just exactly like someone who isn't in Christ. For us who have been born again to this living hope, beloved, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and the sanctification, the setting apart of the Spirit on the basis of the sufficient death of Jesus Christ. Church, one of the great reasons that this is for is exactly what Peter said back in the greeting. You remember what he said back there? We are this for obedience 
to Jesus Christ. That's verse 2. For obedience to Jesus Christ. And it is those who are to be obedient to Jesus Christ that he gives the blessing of grace and peace that it would be multiplied to us. Our great and glorious salvation that we are to bless our God and Father in, this salvation that he has planned from all eternity, is for obedience to Jesus Christ. We're elect exiles for obedience. And now after speaking of this glorious salvation and our hope and joy that is in Christ alone, regardless of our circumstances, this very hope that we saw last Lord's Day, that is what the entirety of the Holy Scriptures is about, from Old Testament to New Testament, about this glorious salvation and this fullness of hope that we have in Christ and live in, that has been revealed to us in the Word of God in its entirety. Here now the Apostle Peter charges us to respond appropriately in that necessary obedience. In that necessary obedience. And the true believer wants to do that. Amen? Amen. The true believer wants to do that. So, to begin, in looking at our verses for this morning, we'll have two overall headings. And our first will be the Christian mindset. The Christian mindset. Maybe you could say the mindset of obedience. The Christian mindset. Verse 13. Therefore, Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so you see, right along with everything that I've just said, Peter grounds this command along with the commands that come after this. Peter grounds these commands on everything that he's just written, on everything that he's written before. That's what the therefore is there for. You've heard that. If you see a therefore in Scripture, you look back because it's grounded on what he just said. Peter looks back on everything he just wrote, on the basis of all of that, of God's glorious salvation in Christ Jesus. He then therefore commands us as God's elect exiles to set our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. At, at his revelation, meaning when he is revealed in fullness. When he returns, when the Lord Jesus returns is what he's talking about. And you remember that is the fullness of this living hope that we've been born again to in Christ. That this inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading that we receive on that day when our fully purified faith will be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of our Lord. Church, the Apostle of Christ tells us that we are to set our hope right now in our lives as Christians, we're to set our hope fully on that. On, on what we know is to come. On the certainty of what we know is to come. Our hope is to be set uh, fully or completely, you can say, on that. So yes, our Lord has completely accomplished, church. He's completely accomplished our utter salvation on the cross, which is seen through his glorious resurrection from the dead. But as he has now ascended to the right hand of the Father with all authority in heaven and earth, working out the implications of his accomplishment on the cross, we are thus to set our hope completely on the fullness of that which comes when he will return just as he has promised. So you see, church, just as the death of our Lord was so perfect and was so full and so utterly complete that it demanded a resurrection, that the necessary consequence of his perfect death was a resurrection. Which is why the, the writer of the Hebrews states in Hebrews 13 verse 20 that the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead by his blood. He was literally raised from the dead by his death. That's how perfect his death was. It, the necessary consequence of his perfect death to the glory of the Father and for the salvation of his people was a resurrection. He was raised from the dead by his perfect death. Just as that is true, just as well it is true that his perfect death also demands and assures us of his return as well. You see, beloved, he must return. The Lord Jesus must return just as he has promised in order to bring to fruition or in order to bring to completion everything he has accomplished in his death for his people. Because in purchasing our utter salvation on the cross, that necessarily includes our inheritance. Our inheritance of being in his presence in sinless, fully saved, glorified bodies that have been resurrected to live on a fully glorified new heavens and new earth, a new creation. And church, in understanding that, 
And that is just another way of seeing the certainty of the return of our Lord. The certainty that the Lord Jesus will return. Not only is he going to return because it's God's predestined plan that he will necessarily bring to pass. Not only is the Lord Jesus going to return because he will do that which he has promised. Right? He is truly God and truly man. He said he will return. He will return. God accomplishes everything he sets his mind to. He is eternally faithful. He will do everything he has said. Not only are those things true, but the Lord Jesus will also return because his perfect death demands that he returns and brings to fruition everything he accomplished on the cross. It's a necessary consequence of his perfect death on the cross. He accomplished it all. He purchased it all on the cross. Therefore, he must return to bring what he accomplished to fruition, to completion. And church, it is on the, the certainty of that, the certainty of what our great God and Savior has done and thus will do when he returns, that we're to completely set our hope on in our time of exile in this fallen world before that happens. We're to set our hope completely on that. I've, I've said this before, but church, we understand here that we do not live in a world this morning that is meaningless. We don't live in a meaningless world, a purposeless world, where just random things happen with no meaning whatsoever. We don't live in a world this morning that is going to continue on in fallenness forever. This is, our, this is our Father's world that we live in. This is the world that our certain God, our faithful creator, upholds by the word of his power. And because of who he is and what he has sufficiently accomplished, we can live our lives right now with certainty. We can live our lives today and evermore with certainty, with our hope completely set on not what might be, but completely set on knowing what will be, knowing what is certainly to come. Beloved, Jesus who died, as the hymn says, will be satisfied. He will be satisfied. The Lamb will receive the full reward for his sufferings. That comes when he returns. And thus, as his purchased people, we are to actively set our hope on that certain truth. Well, brethren, when we do that, that necessarily has an effect on, on our behavior now in our lives. That necessary, when, when, I, when my hope is set on certainty of what will be and what will be then, that necessarily has an effect on how I think now and how I live now, how I make decisions now in my life. When I do that, that motivates me to faithfulness now to my Lord. Church, knowing that when it's all said and done, regardless of how it looks in the world at any time, regardless of, of how bad it may get, regardless of who's in power, regardless of anything, knowing that when it's all said and done, my Lord wins and thus his church wins in him, knowing that, that's definitely going to motivate me to faithfulness now. Because in that, I know that in any opposition we receive, in any opposition whatsoever, regardless of what it looks like, our God is in control of it, and it will not stop him from accomplishing his work through his church. It won't stop. It won't stop from seeing Revelation 7, where all of his purchased people from every tribe, language, and nation is praising him that salvation belongs to he who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It's not going to stop. That will be there. Regardless of what happens in the world, God wins and thus his church does as well in him. All the Father has foreknown, beloved, all the Son has laid his life down for, will be saved. Right? We will receive our inheritance. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's unfading. Kept in heaven for us, who by God's power is guarding us for this salvation, ready to be revealed. Not you know, that might be, I hope so, will be revealed. Ready to be revealed. Certainly will be revealed in the last time. We will receive it. Our faith will be purified. And Jesus will most definitely return. All this is certain. It's 100% certain. Beloved, knowing this should free up and take away any anxieties to serve him faithfully now. It should take away any anxieties to serve him faithfully now. Beloved, our God and Savior has given us the fullness of that which should motivate and compel us to faithfulness to him in our lives right now. The certainty of what he will accomplish through his people and for his people to the glory of his name. He's given us that. Do we deserve that? No. But he's given it to us graciously to motivate us and to compel us to serve him right now. 
Set your hope fully on who I am and what I've done for you on the cross and what will come when I return. No opposition can stop this. Therefore, beloved, what kind of people ought we be in service to our king who cannot be stopped? What kind of people ought we be in service to our king who cannot be stopped? Beloved, this is exactly why in this command to set our hope fully upon this grace that is to be revealed, we have these two qualifiers with it. Uh, because in rightly obeying this command, church, we must prepare our minds for action and we must be sober-minded. And in, in preparing our minds for action and being sober-minded, we are to set our hope fully on the grace that is to be revealed. Now that translation of preparing your minds for action is not necessarily wrong because that is what is meant by the apostle, but I will say that is not what he originally wrote. Though he didn't originally write down preparing your minds for action. Uh, in the Greek, and if you have an ESV, I know for certain that there is a footnote on the page that says this, but in the Greek that phrase is actually girding up the loins of your mind. Girding up the loins of your mind, and since most of us perhaps don't know what that specifically means, to gird up our loins, uh, they translate it the way they do here. Uh, but in this time, when the letter was written, most people, men included, wore loose robes as their clothing. And while that would work fine for ordinary activities, it wasn't that great for strenuous activities where you had to exert a lot of action or had to run or something like that. And so in such cases, the men would gird up their loins with the robe. Uh, they would pull the rope tied up around their legs and they would, they would wrap it around to free up their legs for that exertion, right? So that, so that it, the rope wouldn't get in the way of whatever activity they were to be about. Uh, you could say that it's very similar to a modern saying we have and that someone needed to roll up their sleeves, right? I, I needed to get to work, so I needed to roll my sleeves up so they're not getting in the way. I wanted my hands free. Uh, it essentially means to prepare yourself for strenuous action. Gird up the loins of your mind. Prepare yourself for strenuous action. Do what needs to be done so that you would be prepared for this, so that nothing's getting in the way of the action that your Lord deserves. Which is, again, why they translate it that way, preparing your minds for action. So, church, in setting our hope fully on the certainty of our God and the certainty of the return of Christ, our minds are thus to be prepared for action in Christ, prepared for action in Christ. Understandably, as we are body and soul, everything our bodies do begin in the soul. They begin in the immaterial part of us. Our actions begin in the mind. And so if we are going to rightly act with our bodies in obedience to our Lord as we ought, then we need to be thinking that way. We need to be preparing our minds for action. We need to be thinking that way. Beloved, we are to have this mind amongst us as it is ours in Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who would be zealous for good works, Paul says in Titus 2.14. That's a part of our salvation. Living as he would have us as his creation saved by his grace. And thus, that is the way we're to think. We're to think that way. We're not to think some other way. We're to think in accordance with the way that he would have us. Living as he would have us as his new creations. This is the Christian mindset. It's a mind that is properly set upon the fullness of what Christ has accomplished, and thus a mind that is set upon action and living out what he has accomplished. It's a mind that's set upon living out what he has accomplished. It's set upon that, and thus now I want to live that out. I want to live out what he has accomplished in me and for me. It's a mind that is set for action, prepared for action in active service for our Lord in, in all aspects of our life. And thus, church, it is a mind as well that actually rationally thinks about life, rationally thinks about life and how it is to be lived. How am I to do this? How am I to do this certain thing? How am I to, to live this certain aspect? Of my, what, what decision am I to make here? Peter says we are to be sober-minded. We're to rationally think about things. This is not a mind church that just flows along with whatever the culture is doing. Well, what are the neighbors doing? 
How do, how do they do? What is, the, what is everyone, what's in style today? How are they doing? That's, that's not how we're to do things. It's not a mind that just flows along with whatever the culture is doing or with whatever feels right. No, it's, it's a sober mind that is prepared for action and good works for our Lord. Being sober-minded, the Apostle Peter says. Which, yes, that does have implications with uh, alcohol or any drug or mind-altering substance. We, we are to be sober-minded. We're not to be intoxicated and so forth. That does have implications with that. But you could say very broadly that the sober mind is the mind that is not allowing other created things from the outside to come in and affect its thinking. It's not allowing other created things to come in and, and affect its thinking. Whether that be drugs, whether that be alcohol, or whether that be some, some other, uh, other man-made opinion. The opinion of the culture. The flow of society or something like that. It's, it's a sober mind thinking in accordance with how our God would have us think. The culture isn't affecting it. How I feel, my feelings aren't affecting it. No created thing is affecting the one who is sober-minded. The sober-minded is thinking rationally, consistently about life in light of our God and Savior and His truth alone. They understand that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They understand that, that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ Jesus. They want to think rationally and soberly in accordance with that truth. So in bringing all of this together, church, the Christian mindset is one that in light of the return of our Lord, sober-mindedly thinks and prepares about our service to our Lord now. And thus, church, in preparing itself rightly, it's going to be taking in the word of our Lord and thinking greatly upon it. So, for example, the proper Christian mind is then going to be thinking, here are just some examples. You know, I'm going to be this kind of worker in my job. I know my other co-workers, they may bend the rules at times. They may do these certain things. They're, they're this kind of worker. I'm going to be this kind of worker. Why? Because my God says so. Because, because my God commands me to work heartily as for him and not for man. That in my, in my work and whatever I do, I'm serving the Lord Christ. I'm going to be this kind of worker. You know, I'm going to be this kind of child in my home. I'm going to be this kind of child in my home. I'm going to be honoring to my parents. I'm going to obey my parents and the Lord for this is right. I'm going to model to my other siblings in the home what it looks like to be, to be a child in, in obedience to my God. I'm going, to, I'm going to prepare my mind for action in that sense. This is what the Lord commands. I'm going to be this kind of spouse. I'm going to be this kind of husband, this kind of wife. I'm going to be this kind of father. I'm going to be this kind of mother. I'm going to make these decisions in my life. I'm, I'm going to be this kind of person. I'm going to be this kind of church member because of what my Lord commands. I, you know, I'm going to make this decision in my life and I'm going to seek to carry it out, not because the world and the culture will agree with my decision, but because my God and Savior agrees with this decision. Right? I'm thinking about life and I'm preparing my mind for action. I'm preparing my mind for what I'm going to do in my life in the different situations I come across. Because my desire is to please him and not man. Right? Interestingly enough, we heard that in our scripture reading this morning. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. If I were to please man, if I'm seeking to please man, I, I would not be a servant of Christ. Right? We're not here to please man. Now I hope, I hope mankind, I hope those around me, I hope my family is pleased as I'm seeking to please Christ and serve Christ. But I'm ultimately a follower of his. I'm a servant of Christ, not a servant of man. I'm ultimately here to please him and not those around me. If you're not pleased by Christ, then that's your problem and not mine. I'm here to serve him. I'm here to serve truth and true joy and true righteousness. I'm here to have a mind prepared for action, for service, for my creator, for our creator, for my savior. Well, beloved, that is the Christian mindset. Very plain and simple. That is the Christian mindset. Any other mindset is not Christian. Any other mindset is against Christianity. Though it may profess to be Christian, though it may say, I know God, it's not, it's not a Christian mindset. It's an anti-Christian mindset. But the Christian mindset sober-mindedly prepares for action and service to our Lord, who brings certain victory at his certain return because of his certain and sufficient death on the cross. That is the Christian mindset. And then as we've already mentioned, 
as our actions begin in the mind, now after Peter has shown us the mindset of Christianity, here in our remaining verses he shows us the Christian call to holy obedience. The Christian call to holy obedience. Verse 14 to 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Beloved, you see there in the beginning how Peter defines Christians here in the text. What does he say? Obedient children. Obedient children. Just as Scripture as a whole would affirm, true Christians are obedient children of God. They're not disobedient children. They don't live lives of disobedience. They're obedient children. Yes, we will still disobey, as we've already said. Yes, there will still be sin, but our lives will not be defined by that. Our lives will not be defined by disobedience or sin. The life of the true believer is defined by being an obedient child of God. Right? So, I mean, you look at their life since conversion. Yes, there will be sin. Yes, you, you can see that in their life. But their life overall, as a convert, is a life that's seeking to serve Christ. It's a life of obedience. They're obedient children. Thus, in having the proper Christian mindset and thinking properly, as obedient children, we are not to be conformed to the passions or to the desires, you could say, to the cravings of our former ignorance before we were converted, which should be obvious. We're not to have our minds prepared for no action to God. We're not to have our minds prepared for laziness because that's exactly what they were before we came to Christ. Our minds were ignorant, actively not wanting the true knowledge of our God, and thus they were prepared for no true action to Him. They were prepared for laziness to him, but they were prepared for pure sinful action to satisfy the passions and cravings of our own fallen bodies and minds. But now in Christ church, now we have new cravings. Now in Christ we have new desires. We've been born again, born anew by God who has caused us this to a living hope. We've been given new life, new desires. The old has passed away and the new has come. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. And those new desires are those that our God would have for us in truth. And thus as he who called us his holy church, we are also to be holy in all of our conduct, as Peter says. Right? In all of our thinking, in all of our living, everything, all of our conduct is to be holy. Not some of it. Not, you know, not just part of my life. Not one day out of the week, every day, all of it. All of life is to be in obedience to our Lord. All of our conduct, all of our actions are to be holy, which essentially means the same thing that we've already affirmed that Peter has been saying from our text this morning. And to be holy in its, in its broadest meaning, to be holy means to be different, set apart, peculiar, distinct, Beloved, just as our God is different, utterly different than this fallen, sinful world, so are we to be. We are to be set apart and not like this sinful world, this rebellious world against the truth. Just as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, church, as God's beloved children, we are to be imitators of Him. We're to imitate our God as His beloved children, doing as He would do, and thus obeying His commands. So just as he is holy, therefore we are to be as well. We are to be holy as he is holy. We are to be set apart unto our God and his truth and away from the world and its ways. Set apart from the world and its ways unto our God and his truth. Holy as our God is holy. And as the apostle adds in verse 16, he says, since it is written, you see he bases this on Old Testament scripture. Since it is written... You shall be holy, for I am holy. It's a phrase that Peter takes from the Old Testament. It's said several times by our God in the book of Leviticus. And as we've mentioned before with other Old Covenant terms that Peter has used, he applies this truth that was concerning the Old Covenant people of God, and he applies it to us in the fulfillment of it in the New Covenant in Christ Jesus. I'll give you a couple examples of where this phrase is found. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45. 
In Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, the Lord God tells his people, his covenant people, this. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I'm the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I brought you out to be yours exclusively. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Right? Because of what I've done for you, bringing you out of slavery unto me, Leviticus 11.45, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And then in Leviticus chapter 20, in Leviticus 20, verse 22 to 24, the Lord God tells them again, You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my rules and do them, that the land where I am bringing you to live may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the customs of the nations that I am driving out before you. You don't walk in their ways. You don't walk in the customs of the nation that I'm driving out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I detested them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. I have separated you from them. And then verse 26, he says, you shall be holy to me. You shall be, I've separated you from the peoples. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. You're mine now. You're not a part of the world. I brought you out. You, therefore, should be holy as I am holy. I've separated you from them by my grace. You're mine. I am your God. And beloved, the same is for us as his people today in Christ. This understanding has not changed a bit. It hasn't changed a bit. For he has now in Christ Jesus saved us from a much greater enslavement than merely being physically enslaved in Egypt. But he has saved us and brought us out of enslavement to sin. A much greater ensla enslavement. He's called us out of being aligned with this sinful and rebellious world. And he's separated us from the peoples that we would be his elect exiles amongst the nations. And that he would be our God who has given us the earth as an inheritance. Therefore, church, we are to be holy as he is holy. We are to be holy as he is holy. We are to show forth in every aspect of our lives what it means to be his called out people in the midst of this rebellious world. We are to be in this world, but we are not to be of it. We are not to be aligned with it at all. Why? Because we've been set apart. He separated us from the peoples that he would be our God. That we would be his. This is the Christian call to holy obedience, beloved. This is the Christian call to holy obedience. If we're in Christ this morning, this is what we've all been called to. Understand if we don't already, church, that there is no such coexistence of some Christians who are obedient children, some Christians who seek to be holy in all their conduct, just as their God and Savior is holy, and then there are also some Christians who don't seek to be any of those things at all. No, that doesn't exist. Before I was converted, I thought that existed. I called myself Christian because I prayed a prayer one time. But I would readily admit that I didn't care about holiness at all. I didn't care about Christ. I didn't care about my neighbor coming to faith. I didn't care about salvation. I didn't care about praising him. I didn't care about the Bible, the truth, his church. I didn't care about any of that. I wasn't a Christian. I was disobedient. As we read from 1 John 3 this morning. I was clearly showing by my actions and my thoughts that I was a child of the devil and I was not a child of God. This is what we've been called to. Holy obedience. A mindset prepared for action. A mindset prepared to serve and follow our Lord. Beloved, his sheep follow him. They obey him. That's what defines their lives. We have sober minds set upon the grace that is to be fully revealed at the coming of our Lord. And thus minds that are now prepared for action and that overflows into obedience and holiness in every aspect of our lives. Very simply, does that describe you this morning? Does that describe you this morning? If not, may by the grace of our Lord you truly repent and believe upon Christ while he's giving you time. 
He's given you time to hear his truth this morning. He's given you time to hear his word this morning. He's accomplished everything for your utter salvation, for your reconciliation to him, to be taken out of sin, to be made holy, to be sanctified in the spirit. He's accomplished everything uh, for that in Christ Jesus. Repent and believe and trust yourself to Christ while God has given you time. Experience that. Live in true joy and righteousness and fulfillment. Be holy as he is holy. And if that does describe you, your mind is set upon that hope. You're seeking to serve him. You're seeking to, to live a life of action and be holy as he is holy. Brethren, if that does describe you, keep fighting the good fight. He's worthy. Amen? Keep fighting the good fight. And may you continue, may we all continue to prepare our minds for action. Actions that our Lord gave his life for us to be about. The good works that he gave his life for us to be zealous about. May we continue to seek to be holy as our God who has called us to Christ through his glorious gospel is holy. And to these ends, may, uh, may the Holy One, may he who is holy, our God, bless the preaching of his word this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we declare your truth that we have heard from your word. That you are holy. As your word declares elsewhere, you are the one who is holy, holy, holy. Uh, utterly separated from this world. Holy, holy, holy. Uh, the whole earth is full of your glory. You are the one who is and who was and who is to come. We, we do not deserve at all to know you. To be reconciled to you. That you've given us that great privilege in accordance with your great wisdom and love. How, how wondrous is your grace. How wondrous is your love. That the great gap that was between us. Between you who are holy, holy, holy. And us who in, in our sin are, are totally unholy and unclean. That that great gap has, has been completely reconciled by your work and your work alone in Christ Jesus. Our great God and Savior, truly God, truly man, entered into the darkness, entered into to uncleanness, and into this, this land filled with unholiness, and lived the perfect, holy life. Father, set, set apart unto you. Oh, he said that his food was to do, to, to do the will of, of his Father. Apart from conversion, our, our will has been to do nothing but the will of uh, of the devil to just do our own opinion to do our own way seeking joy in, in created things that could never give it and were never created to give it but his food, his sustenance what kept him going, his joy Father was to do your will to live in perfect righteousness and that took him to the cross where he died the horrible death that we all deserve took the hell that we all deserve and rose from the dead that we his people would be reconciled to our creator and that we would be made new that we would be enabled to prepare our minds for action and be sanctified in the spirit set apart made holy as you are holy thus father stir us up and strengthen your people in accordance with your truth this morning that we would be more and more that we would be set apart more and more that we we, we would grow in holiness Father, if, if this is in, even an, an ability here in, in your world in Christ Jesus, regardless of our size, may we be the holiest church that be on the face of the earth. May, 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 may we be a church that is, is the most pleasing in your sight, in accordance with your truth, from the heart, loving you, seeking to love you, seeking to love your people, and, and out of that, that mind of love and preparing for action, set upon the hope of the grace that will fully come at the return of our Lord, that we, we serve you truly and completely from your word. May, may you grant that. May this be, be a, a place of, of, of true love and joy and peace and righteousness and, and fellowship with you. May, may we be a great house for you, our Lord and God, as living stones whom you built together. We would offer up sacrifices pleasing to you in Christ Jesus. Forgive us for where we have failed you in that. Continue to reform us. Continue to strengthen us, sanctify us. 
Bless our day in this. And you continue to bless our worship this day. Bless our fellowship in this. May your saints be built up and may, may your name be hallowed in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.